You're listening to the Dune Sh- Steve. Um, yeah. You're listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. And now is here. And now here's your hosts. What is this? Don't you guys have anything interesting to talk about? Hi, here's Harry Potter. Hello. Wait, how does Harry Potter talk? Uh, Expecto Patronum. Patronum. Nice. That didn't sound anything like that. That's 100% perfect. Uh, Hey, this is Rich Outfield. Uncanny, some might call it. This is Big Anchorman. Use more words. (laughs) We uh, have fallen behind in our podcast. We have? Desperately behind. It is freaking July again. Just wanted you all to know. Oh, boy. That's what the shining sun outside is telling you. It's July once again. So I asked people if they wanted us to post our Harry Potter review, our review of the new movie in... 2D? Late December. Oh. In 2D, yes. Or 3D. <laughs> it turns out they don't get a choice. It's 2D all the way. I asked people if they, they wanted us to post it now or wait until like late December, which actually means early January. And people were like, oh, go ahead and post it. Go ahead and post it. If it's not too much trouble. I have no idea why I'm doing terrible accents today, but it's all for oh, you, Dave. okay. People have probably seen the picture of you wearing the lucky the leprechaun costume, so maybe they just understand immediately why you go there. That's right. And you know why I went there. So this is going to be our review of Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows Part 1. We'll throw in a couple other things at the end, like it's a real show. But uh, just wanted to get something new out there that, for people that like us. Or people that are, you know, twitching and they're in withdrawal right now. They have lovely voice. <laughs> Because you know that they're out there. They're, they are. Yeah, all those fans of Kermit the Frog are... <laughs> okay. So uh, introduce our conversation about Harry Potter in the voice of Kermit the Frog. So here you go, folks. I love that. I, that is dead on. <laughs> okay, I will do... Uncanny. I will do Piggy, and you will do Kermit. Oh, Kermit, what do we got coming up now? Oh, that's too much. Pitiful. Good night, folks. <laughs> I guess this is taking us off on a tangent here, but I, I, we're probably done speaking of the story, right? Do you have anything else to say? No? So, uh, hopefully by the time this actually airs, I mean, it won't be opening weekend anymore, so everybody will have seen the movie by then, so we can safely... As far as the studios are concerned, everybody has seen it now. Yeah. It's already over and done, because what? It's Sunday of opening weekend of Harry Potter now, and so they're done with it. They've washed their hands of it and have moved on to part two. So anyways, I just thought it would be cool to talk about Harry Potter. And What's the crazy is, sorry to interrupt you, man. Deadly Hallows. There, but I got it even in. if it only made $300 million, which it will make more than domestically, it'll still make more in the time past the opening weekend than it will opening weekend. Well, there's that guy who left the comment from the last time we complained about that whole thing, that supposedly the studio's get a lot more of the opening weekend and early on run of the... So maybe... Sure, they will, but we're talking about a third of the total run of the film. And yet it's so much more of a priority than the rest, than than, than leaving it, than having people go again, than making something quality that people want to see again and again. (laughs) I... Still baffled by that. Well, well, I'm I'm constantly baffled by illogical things. <laughs> Once I've reached an age where I feel like I understand how things work, when something goes against that, it doesn't make any sense. Yeah. yeah. For example, this week I was working a lot at work, and I had to go somewhere on Monday and Wednesday immediately after work. And we had one boss those days. And he would just, as soon as as it got slow at work, he'd let people go home. Because his theory was, why pay you for doing no work? But then Thursday and Friday, I had a different boss. And that boss's theory was, you are scheduled to so-and-so time. You will work until so-and-so time. Even if there's nothing for you to do, that's when you're scheduled to. So you need to work to that. And to me, it just made no sense. You're paying me when I don't need to be here. Why not save the company money by sending me home? Again, it's just like, I don't understand the logic of that sticking to the rule of, well, you were scheduled till 12, so you're going to work till midnight, dude. But I guess there are always things like that. And the whole theatrical, you know, whatever it is. I've come to start 
you know, recently I've come to think that maybe it's just that the studios make so much money on DVD sales. It seems to me that these days movies are released in theaters as basically a commercial for the DVD. The more it makes in the theaters and the bigger of a deal that it is there, then the more DVD sales they can depend on making. You know, I don't know if you've ever bought DVDs from the store. You can buy like a hundred burnable DVDs for like 30 cents. I don't know. They're so effing cheap, a DVD. And they sell these things to us for what, $20? Blu-rays they're selling for even $30. You know, they're making money so out of control with DVDs that uh, I think it's got to be something like that. They're just like, get it out there and get people to know about this so we can sell them the DVD later. That's all that matters to them anymore, it seems. It's not the theatrical run at all or how much money it makes in that realm. It's probably the least profitable part of a, you know, movies have tons of different release windows that they're going through, you know, and theatrical is just the first one. And I'm sure they just keep making money. But just like music, where we had the 8-track, and we had the cassette, and we had the CD, and we had the mini disc, and we have whatever it might be, the download... It started with vinyl, and there are people that are always going to go back for that vinyl. I'm blown away that stores carry more vinyl now than they did 10 years ago. That's true. In my mind, I imagine the theatrical experience is like that. True. That that's how it started. In in people who love film, that's how they want yeah. to see we'll movies. And hopefully, return. Yeah. It's one of those things that won't go away no matter... You know, I mean, now they don't even show movies on film for the most part. They just have some kind of a, I don't know, what do they do? Do they use a C- satellite, I thought, or something like that? that they get well, a- there's just the digital projector. It's like they download it and then they show right. it. The Harry Potter we saw, though, was on film. Did you notice? Yeah, even I did notice. It was the, the first and showing there. <laughs> and there were a couple of jumps. <laughs> right. I did notice that. So anyways, yeah, that's what we're talking about is Harry Potter, Deathly Hallows Part 1. Rish and I went and saw it this weekend. Rish really wanted to see it opening weekend, and we weren't desperate to see the very, very first showing. We would have been happy to see it Saturday afternoon, but our schedules just wouldn't work out. The only way we could see it was that very first midnight showing. We even had to, because we hadn't planned ahead like everybody else in the world had, and bought tickets a month or two. I think they were selling tickets to this like six months ago. We hadn't done that. So at the last minute, we got on the Fandango. That's the uh, paper sack puppet right. website, right? Did you get as sick of those as I did? or uh, You no. probably got more sick of them because you go to way more movies than I do. They were annoying, but I've seen so much more. <laughs> so many worse things than that. Uh, so we got on there, got tickets, and we managed to get to the uh, 12.05 showing of the movie on the very first night that it came out. And thank goodness for handicapped seating again, folks. <laughs> I know that I'll probably do time in purgatory for it, but I was so far away. And, and again, that was the night where the boss is like, no, you're scheduled. And, t- and, it's just like, <laughs> right. oh. and I had paid for the tickets myself with my mm. credit card. So Big couldn't get in. You had to produce that credit card that you yep. paid for it with. So he saw lines of people going in and seating while he had to wait outside. And yeah, they didn't have a line where they said, okay, the line for this showing is here, the line for this one's here. They had the whole theater open. They're like, no, we're already seating them now. Yeah, go ahead and go on in. Oh, you don't have your tickets? Oh, well, you're screwed. And so, yeah, everything was taken. But yeah, most people uh, have the decency. They have the shame or something that they won't sit in the handicapped seats, whereas we have no shame. So (laughs) we sit right in there every time. If we had gotten in earlier, we wouldn't have sat there. (laughs) And again, if somebody in a wheelchair or somebody with only half a face had shown up, I would have flipped a coin at him, and then we would have gotten up and and given our seats to that person. Yeah, so there's that. We weren't trying to be that way but you know there wasn't anybody to kick us out at least i hope there wasn't maybe there's was somebody that was too shy to ask <laughs> they were unable to get up the stairs so they just had to sit in the aisle so i don't know <laughs> anyway oh that's awful yeah so we saw the movie it was it was pretty interesting you know i've not been to a harry potter midnight showing before this is the showing where the really big fans show up and there were people dressed up left and right and there must have been 10 showings at least that were at that one they were they were probably showing it in every theater that they had so maybe more than 10 showings that were going on at that's a lot 
of folks there, and many of them were dressed up. I saw a lady that had a really awesome Professor McGonagall type hat mm. that was just all bent and crooked as it went up to the point. What, did you see any really good costumes? I'm trying to think of what other ones I saw. There was a lot of people that were, you know, wearing Hogwarts robes with the red and yellow scarf or the green and silver scarf or whatever. I have no memory of oh, that, yeah. really. It just I, I looked all over for you, <laughs> and then I guess I was freaked out that we weren't going to get a seat. Why You I, were there a long time. I was before. there for almost 45 minutes before you showed up, so I did get a chance to get a gander at things a lot more than you. I can't think of any other. We, we've talked about this before on the show, like the time that you went to, what was it, Unforgiven or something like that, all dressed in we Western dressed wear. Cowboys, yeah. I think that's cool. I know that a lot of people will just totally rail on people and make fun of nerds that will dare to dress up and go out to something. But all I can say is whatever you have fun doing, you know, go for it. Seriously, life's too short to worry about crap like that. Worry about what the a-holes will say about you dressing up and going out to a movie that way. Well, I remember the night that this book came out, The Deathly Hallows came out. I asked my niece if she wanted to go to the Barnes & Noble, had a big party. Right. And so I took her and and we went and we participated in all these Harry Potter related games and stuff. And then everybody participated in the countdown like it was New Year's Eve. And, <laughs> And I thought that was cool, and, and I wasn't able to get a book. They were already gone. So we went <laughs> nice. to Walmart, and right outside the door of Walmart, there were like three or four frat-type guys. I, I probably told you this before, so you I know it's coming. So. But as one, as people were entering, they chanted, it's just a book. And dude... Oh gosh, the emperor, <laughs> the hate was swelling me. I, you know, I seriously, I would have killed every single one of these bastards and slept totally fine the next night because the literacy rate is so low <laughs> in America and people are so stupid and so loath to think or do anything that expands the mind. And just how inspiring it was to me that millions of adults and kids were dedicated enough to these books to, you know, just read a, a, a five-year-old kid sitting still for his mom to read Harry Potter to him or a 10-year-old kid reading an 800-page yeah. book. Dude, that is just, that gives me hope that the next generation is not going to suck. And these four, help, <laughs> wads, <laughs> was standing there saying, tell me, boy. <laughs> and it just stopped and said, have you ever read one? But yeah, you know, Harry Potter really is an amazing uh, series because of that. And you've seen, uh, maybe you haven't, I don't know, I've seen, I've noticed that uh, since then, the young adult category of books has just exploded with titles for people to read. And lots of these books, it's not just Harry Potter that became a series and then it was over and it was just a flash in the pan. Since then, there's been several other series. There was this series of unfortunate events that b became a big deal. They made a movie out of it, and folks went to see it. There was those uh, Percy Jackson books that uh, became a big deal enough that kids went out and read them, and they made a movie out of them. I'm sure there's more. I can't come up with them really quick off the top of my head, but it became such a thing that people, you know, it's like when you tried to read the Twilight books, you know, you, you're like, well... It's such a big deal that I have to at least see what the hell's going on. Right. I don't like to be that guy that doesn't <laughs> right. get the joke. And so all and, – and this was that times 10, you know. Everybody was just like, oh, well, I, I guess I got to check these out. And people went. They read them and they liked them enough that they changed from being the type of a-holes that would stand outside of a store and say it's only a book and became people that read and so they were done with it, and they're like, oh, geez, I'm done. I've, I've read these all, and well, there's got to be other stuff. And that's where these other books suddenly started taking off. Yeah, it's become a really big thing, and I think that is so great. You know, I think the literacy rate, I wouldn't be surprised if it's better and for it this rising generation than it ever was for our own generation and generations before us just because of that phenomenon. You could probably trace it right back to that. And, you know, that's something I, I know I said six months ago or a year ago in an episode where I was just railing about how badly written that first Twilight book was or how unappealing the movies are to me. I can bag on them 
almost completely, but I've got to reserve a tiny bit of praise for anything that gets kids or young people to read a book, to open a book, to, to turn off the TV yeah. and engage their mind. And Twilight has definitely done that for a whole series of Y chromosome free people. And <laughs> and good, good man. I, good on you. What? <laughs> <clears throat> but uh, yeah, as far as the uh, seventh movie goes, I don't know how long we want to talk about it because there's a lot that I could say. Mm hmm. And then there's a lot that, you know, why would I? Nobody's going to care six months from now what we thought of Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows Part 1. True. But the one thing I wanted to say right right off the bat was that my cousin, one of his coworkers went and saw it on Friday, and he complained bitterly about the ending. And again, I hate to use that word, but I'm going to. I asked him, well, what kind of... Mongoloid would not know that this is a half of, of the adaptation. In my whole life, I have never seen a movie with part one in the title. Never. Yeah. We went and saw Fellowship of the Ring opening night. And when that ended the way it did, there were groans of, oh, 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 what? That's it? In the audience. And I was just like, oh, wow, that's interesting. So many people didn't realize that this is the first of a trilogy kind of thing. But, uh, dude, you would have to be a vegetable to not know. <laughs> I mean, just to the title of the movie alone yeah. and the way that they've done it. And uh, so, yeah, to me, that just is really surprising. But for I don't know how long since they announced that the seventh book would be split. But ever since that happened, there were people that were saying that that's a cash in, that that's just crass, that that's just... Uh -huh. Greed right. on their part. And I've always, always countered with no. You know, the, the chief complaint that fans of the books have with the movies is that they leave way too much out. Yeah. And this seventh book, which is more jam packed with data than all of the others, will benefit so much more by being split. And, and I totally felt that that was the you case. You know, that's, I don't remember seeing data in that show at all. He was in there? He was in He's the, not the even ministry. English, is he? He, the, oh, he was the ministry the min scene. Oh. He was the elevator, uh, the, the guy that ran the elevator. Oh, I see. And, and he, at one point he said, I do not believe I've seen you here before. Okay, I'm <laughs> sorry. And that, I should have just left that joke out altogether. That was. I wondered bad. why you smirked when I started to say <laughs> that because I was like, oh, this is one of those fucktards that thinks that the seventh book is beep. Born. Oh, I'm sorry. There's going to be a great deal of profanity. <laughs> On this. And, and you know, it's not fair. If you didn't like the movie, if you don't like Harry Potter, if you don't like the books, you're still a person and all that. I shouldn't call you names, but I'm going to. <laughs> How could you have ever been nominated for a Parsec? I could see those people's point of view where they say, oh, this is just a cash in. This is this is them saying, oh, crap, this is the last one. We're not getting any more money. Let's make two movies out of it so we can get more money. They've been talking about splitting these books into two movies since all the way back in the fourth one came out which was the first That's true they talked about splitting the fourth yeah which was the first really thick one you know when those books came out the first one was almost your standard child size book i mean it was probably just barely over 300 pages and the second one was the same and then the third one was now like 450 and then all of a sudden that fourth one was 700 i mean they were like wow children are reading books that are longer than war and peace you know, ever since then, they were like, oh, yeah, they were thinking about splitting this one into two, but they didn't. And I thought they were OK. The fourth one, the fifth one were pretty good, even though they didn't split them in two. But I remember when I went to see the sixth book, I was really disappointed with the when I went to see the sixth book, the sixth movie. I didn't actually see the book. I was really disappointed in the way it turned out. It seemed to me like that one, I guess they should have split it into two. I went and saw it with my kids. I think my oldest son had actually read the book already, but the, the other two hadn't yet. And they just couldn't follow it well enough to understand what was going on. They kept saying, Daddy, why, why is he doing this? Daddy, what's going on here? And I could tell what was going on because, you know, I'd read the book already, so I knew it was the deal. But it seemed like they just had too much jam-packed into that movie. They weren't able to give it time 
to develop. The, the plot points couldn't be introduced and then take their time to maybe fade away a little bit so that when it comes back, you can be surprised by it. It basically had to be introduced. Next scene, oh yeah, this Result. is the payoff. Because there are so many things in the book that they had to do you know what i mean you go through the books and you when you're writing the script you're like okay well this is a unnecessary subplot oh uh, this one's unnecessary you know they took all that crap out and they still had a huge amount that they just had to jam pack in there what amazes me is the whole half-blood prince was considered a an unnecessary subplot wow it, yeah it just wasn't satisfying at all for me i know that you have said before that you felt differently you really liked that movie and and thought it was well done and i no no it's my least favorite of the seven my cousin absolutely hated it though. he said you know i won't buy it and i said oh i'll still buy it and i, yeah, I thought it was better the second time i but yeah it w i was much more disappointed with it than right i haven't seen it a second time so maybe i would have a less harsh judgment of it if i did but yeah so far we haven't bought it I don't know if that's just the fact that I've kind of become jaded on the whole buying of DVD concept at all because I never watch the DVDs that I own and I've realized I'm completely wasting a large amount of money by buying these stupid things in the first place. Or if it's because when I saw the movie, I just wasn't as blown away at, with it as I was by others. I, I'm not sure what it is that kept me from buying the DVD so far. I figure I'll probably find it for much cheaper here shortly, and so I can uh, get it then. But uh, yeah, you know, the, the difference between that book being turned into a movie and this final book being turned into a movie, I think it's made all the difference that they split it into two. The plots and all those things in this new movie were able to breathe. They were able to develop slowly. They didn't have to be thrown at you super fast. Go, go, go. Get there's this, and then there's this, and then there's this, and... It made it so much better. It was a much better experience for me to watch that film. And, uh, you know, I'm really looking forward to how they do the final bit. So that's my main impression from part one of The Deathly Hallows. What was that? I don't know. I didn't hear anything. It sounded very much like the wailing of a damned soul. Oh, maybe it's the ghost back for more. You know, I don't think we got a single comment on that. Huh. Maybe it sounded staged to people or something. <laughs> like, hey, very funny. No, we actually almost, well, Big here was molested by the ghost. <laughs> it was kind of a la that Ghostbuster scene. Yeah. But she was much, much uglier. I don't know how much more we need to talk. I, I, I want to talk more, though. So before we say anything more about the movies, I'd like to talk to you about the whole splitting. Okay. Idea. Splinching? Ron got splinched. <laughs> and yeah, that came out of friggin' nowhere. There'd never been any warning about splinching. There'd never been any definition about splinching. All of that cutting room floor to go on with the, the next point that needs to be made. Which, you know, is too bad. Is it that seeing the way that the seventh movie turned out makes me wish that they had been able to do that with previous films. Or they'd gone the Peter Jackson route and had all of this extra footage that got put into it for the DVD release. So you could see Dobby in movies three, four, five, and six. <laughs> right. To know that he's still around and give some of these characters that are in the credits, but you never see them a, <laughs> right. a line or two. And to me, like that's, Warwick Davis, where we're like, what? Well, he I, was in this? I guess Flitwick was supposed to be in there somewhere. I didn't see him, but he definitely played Grip Hook, that uh, uh -huh. really, really ugly goblin. Is his name Grip Hook? See, I always said Griff Hook because it's PH together. Oh. I don't I wonder about that. Sometimes you you say it that way and sometimes you don't. Here well, and there. I don't know. But but like Cho Chang was in the credits. Yeah, I didn't and see her at all, but it, I, I suppose she might have been on the train or something. I would suppose so. And I guess the one that says my father will hear about this was that movie only character Nigel, all grown up. That's my guess. I have no idea who he was, but <laughs> Nigel was in the credits. All right. Um, you know who I'm talking about? The guy that should be Dennis um, Creevy. Okay, yeah. I think I know who you're talking about. What was the Colin what? Creevy's little brother uh -huh. is who Nigel should have been. Okay, so Matrix sequel was uh -huh. split into two. Right. And again, I won't say whether that movie is good or the truth, but <laughs> it was so obvious 
that it was one movie that had been split into two. To me, uh-huh. to you as well. I never saw those. I was a conscientious objector to that uh, whole thing. I my theory is that the series was over when that first movie was done. That was the end, and they didn't need more. Well, it definitely ended once he became the one. It was over. Yeah, it was like doing he a could, Highlander two. Yeah, or, he could you know, see which th- they would never do. <laughs> he could see through the Matrix. You know, he could defeat it without even trying. Now, so why is there anything more? It's done. No, it's a good point. Okay, uh, Pirates of the Caribbean two was split into two. Uh-huh. And I felt that there were some moments in there where it's just like, wow, th- this has no... This do- adds nothing to the... F- now, of course, I like the Pirates sequels way more than I do the Matrix sequels. Uh-huh. But yeah, there, I, I think, think most people do. I, I think, think there are just consensus. long expanses where it just feels like they're treading water to me. Yeah, there is. There, uh, and the one thing that I always thought was really strange was in Pirates 2 where they had more than one scene where the same thing happened... You mean the rolling thing? Right, the rolling happened. thing happened at two, either end of the film. I was just like, wow, they're doing this again? Really? They, they, oh, they put in the wrong reel. We're watching Yeah, the... they didn't even wait till the third movie to bring that back up, at least. They're doing it in the same... Oh, all right. And that one was fairly long, too. They could have done away with some of that extended amount of sword fighting scenes, etc., that... And they would have been just fine. But Oh, I wish you had seen those Matrix sequels. <laughs> what about going way back on that to Back to the Future parts 2 and 3, which were basically one film. That's true. Well, and I, they I would like, like Matrix and Pirates. They basically shot them at the same time as well. Right. But can you imagine how much less effective Back to the Future 2 would have been if the future scene had been like 22 minutes of the film and then it went back to... 55 and then it went back to 1885 all in the same movie yeah that would have been bad it was too much of an idea to be one movie but it was one story you know what i mean Mm -hmm. unlike the first film which was complete when it was finished you know you had seen the whole story you know those two were not that way you know you had to see the third one to finish it off although they did sort of resolve the problems of part two you know they ended up with him left in the friggin wild west when it was over so something had to be done now see i i i still even though i'm i'm an abject failure want to be a filmmaker and the idea of a cliffhanger ending versus some kind of resolution is one of those questions that people have to ask themselves. And and it's so rare that the cliffhanger ending works, I think, Mm -hmm. in the movies. On television, of course, it's great because you want them to come back next week, and that's what TV is all about. Right. You already know that it's airing every week, so you'll be back for the next one anyways. Yeah. But it's just very interesting. Uh, When I was reading the seventh book, Back to Harry Potter, I wondered, okay, where is the place where you will split this? Uh Uh-huh. And... I was thinking about that when the movie was coming out and while we were watching it. Uh And I didn't know the book well enough. But when it happened, I knew that was the ending. Right. Before it even faded, it was just, this feels like an ending. You know what I mean? There was a lot unresolved, but it wasn't wasn't Doc Brown dies and it wasn't Agent Smith is in the bed next to Neo. You know, it was just a... It's a comeback for more, but this is the end of this chapter kind of thing. I, I was satisfied by the ending. Me too. Because I so enjoyed the film, and, and, and there, was, it, there was a lot to take in, and I felt like it was so masterfully done that uh, I would have enjoyed it to go on three more hours or whatever, but I, <laughs> it, but I knew it couldn't, and it was like, oh, okay, good. That's a good point to rest. Right. You know, speaking of that, I, I thought it was kind of interesting. They had showings, and, I, and they did this way back when like, Return of the Jedi finally came out. They had showings where they did all three movies in one day kind of a thing, or... They even actually went so far as to do all six movies in one day at some places, I think, when uh, whatever the hell that third movie was called came Sith. out. Da- yes, the adventures of the Sith. To- Drawing of the Sith. Sith happens. The <laughs> Sith hits the fan, I believe it was called. That's right. And so apparently uh, they did that with this whole series. They decided to do marathon watchings of all the Harry Potter movies up to this one. Which would make sense if this was the last one, but it wasn't the last one. Why would they do that? I don't get it because people would have so much more free time in the summer than they would the week before Thanksgiving. I thought it was just so strange that 
Here, let's watch seven of the eight movies all in a row, everybody. Yay. I didn't know anything about that. That's very strange, I thought. But anyways, back to the splinching. I mean, the splitting of the films. (laughs) In two, since Harry Potter announced that they were going to split the final book in two, Twilight Part 4 has announced that they are also going to split the final book in two. And isn't there another... Something that's coming out that they were also splitting? The Hobbit. Ah, The Hobbit. That's right. The Hobbit, which is not a massive, all-inclusive, gigantic type book. It's a book for kids. It's little limey kids. Yeah. I mean, the friggin' dwarves' names all rhyme, or at least sound the same. Dude. Oin. Gloin. Gloin? (laughs) I don't know. Maybe we shouldn't go see that. Uh, Sorry. (laughs) But, uh, you know, it's... So much less of a gigantic book that I don't know, maybe they're going to be adding in other things from Tolkien's Silmarillion or I don't know what they're going to be doing. But Whole cloth, I believe, is the term that you're looking for. (laughs) It's just strange, but, you know, Harry Potter did it. And so they're like, hey, yeah. Well, look, if Harry Potter had done 70 million in its whole run because the word got out that it was so disappointing that they split it or whatever, there's no chance... In Dante's Inferno, Breaking Dawn would continue to be split into two. Wow, look at you, knowing the title and Uh, everything. Well, you're a fan, aren't you? You've been hiding this from us all. The the Sith hit the fan. (laughs) And, you know, I think now that this has happened, people may be more willing to split, to splinch their movies. Yeah, I think that's likely. It's too bad they didn't try it with book four after all. I still like that film adaptation. Oh, yeah. I like it a lot, too. I'm just saying. Can you imagine if you had twice as much? Wouldn't it be be twice as good? Hi? Why are you nudging me? (laughs) You know, when those benighted Star Wars prequels came out. Again. Star Wars again? Oh, holy cow. Here he is. Yes, we are. The first movie is so worthless. Yeah. I'm not making a judgment call on the quality of the film, but as importance to the saga, Phantom Menace holds no weight at all. Right. It, it introduces the characters, but nothing happens. You could miss. Of you weight. could not know that that existed, and second part would not be any less for you. And you know, it's kind of a shame that he couldn't have done episode two, and then episode three is the Clone Wars, and then episode four is the. You know, whatever uh, Sith hits the fan. I believe they've already made uh, episode four. I hear you, but I'm just... <laughs> I think it would have worked so much better with Anakin as a young man, played by the same actor in all three movies, and just all this talk for 30-something years about the Clone Wars, and we don't even see it. Now, granted, I guess there's a cartoon and all yeah, that, but there that's you not go. the same thing. There were Ewok movies, too. <laughs> But <laughs> there were droid cartoons too. But you know, around 2004 or t- 2003, sometime around then, when I would get together with my circle of friends, including you, and we would speculate about what had to happen in 2005 in episode three. We had well, what subplots needed to be resolved, what things still needed to happen to tie in with what has been revealed in the other movies, and all that. I, I, I used to think, geez, I wonder what would happen if he decided that, yeah, it was just too much stuff. Because it was. It was so much stuff that when that movie finally did come out, it was two and a half hours, and it resolved about a third of those things. Uh-huh. And poorly. Okay. I just thought, well, what would happen if he said, we're going to have to do a Episode three, and then episode four will no longer be Star Wars, but it'll be the the second part. And then you know we're just going to push them all, renumber them all, which isn't beyond what Lucas would do. Right? At yeah, all. he has no. This is the guy who changed Raiders of the Lost Ark to Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark. You are the um, all so, singing, all dancing crap of the world. And I, I don't know. I just I think it would have been more satisfying had this happened. Had perhaps. Anakin turned to the dark side at the end of episode three, and then we've got a whole episode four of the fall of the Republic and Anakin versus Obi-Wan and and please make up something satisfying that happens to Padme. <laughs> but I, I don't know why. But she died why, of a broken heart. Oh, did you really say that? Dude, <laughs> where is that brain bleach that Clay Duggar was talking about? <laughs> But oh, I think that we'll see a lot more of that sort of thing going on. Oh, now, yeah. I don't know in what, but yeah, I can't but as think long of as a good example of what should do that with next. But yeah, I could see that happening. 
And, you know, with The Hobbit Part 1 and 2, and, and maybe all of these movies will now be called Part 1 and Part 2 mm-hmm. because of the precedent of Harry Potter. And if anybody says, well, what about Godfather Part 2? That's not what I'm talking about. The Godfather was never called The Godfather Part 1. Right. You know, with The Hobbit, people will say, well, yeah, it's such a small book or whatever. Or that, again, that's just money grubbing is what it is. <laughs> but it's possible, I, but I feel I owe Peter Jackson yeah, my trust I believe in Peter Jackson. and allegiance. And if he says that we're going to work in Saruman as a good wizard and Galadriel and all these things into it right. in a satisfying way, I'll say, okay, yeah, I will I take your word for it. And, and until I'm proved wrong, I will wholly support Peter Jackson. And if right. he says, we're going to do a trilogy of Hobbit films and they're going to be rhyming titles. <laughs> I will be like, and I'll be like, the wow. Hobbit, part one, that's, boin. That's part the, two, gloin. <laughs> <laughs> Even if he said that, I would say, you know, those titles don't sound good, but... But they're better than Attack of the Clones. Oh, hell yes. <laughs> I, but, you know, the, the, I'm trying to think of a, a, a movie with a terrible title that we've all accepted, but I can't come up with it now because <laughs> terrible titles are still terrible. You know, this is the guy who managed to make almost a four-hour-long version of King Kong. So I can easily see him making Hobbit into a... I guess probably six hour extravaganza without, well, maybe you might overdo it a little because King Kong, they overdid it a little. Did you see the four hour version? No, I saw the theatrical. Lots, lots more monsters. <laughs> no, I saw the theatrical version and I was already like, holy crap, still? Really? More? Oh, come on. That it wasn't scene as- with the t- Tyrannosaurus <laughs> creatures or whatever, where it just she keeps falling and they keep trying to get her and then they miss and then they fight and then she falls and there's another one. It's it's almost like he did it on a dare. <laughs> so, and, and- it wasn't as bad as the end of Return of the King where I had drunk a whole large soda during the movie and when it got to the end and it ended and then, nope, there's another ending and then it ended. Nope, there's another ending and I was just like, oh. You know, they had to I, remove that whole bank of seats from the theater. <laughs> yeah, it finally just erupted. It, it burst. You've seen where the dam breaks at the end of uh, X-Men 2? Yeah, it was kind of like that. But uh, yeah, so, you know, I, I trust in Peter Jackson and I don't give a crap about Twilight. But I actually have, you know, like y- you admitted that you tried to read those books. I had the audio versions of those so oh interesting it was much simpler for me i didn't have to really put any effort into it i was just you just laid there i just laid there yes you closed your eyes and you thought about england (laughs) i was driving to work anyways so i managed to get through i've I've listened to all of those books and so i've heard breaking dawn and i know the way it goes and i could see where they could split that into two it wouldn't be too difficult so you're saying that it's not just a crass no i don't grab for money I don't but think what so. what about the book uh, retelling Twilight, but from Edward's point of view? Is that a grass money grubbing? Uh, I would think so, but... What about Tales of the Beetle Bard? <laughs> you know, it's funny because I have that book, but I've never even cracked it open yet. I don't, I don't know. Uh, sorry, you got something? No, no. Keep, let's keep talking. I, I'm really, really enjoying this. And I know that... The, okay, well, we didn't really address... Uh, We did a That Gets My Goat episode in the place of a regular episode because we were really behind on these Broken Mirror stories. And we had rushed and worked really hard to get all the Halloween episodes in for October. But, you know, there were people that were like, "Uh, you know, this isn't the same thing as the show. There, There was nobody that shook their fist and said, how dare you waste my time with this? But there were some people that were less than pleased. But maybe this should be part of That Gets My Go because that show, I just do for me. (laughs) I talk and I talk and I listen to what you have to say and we joke around Uh and it's fun. And if nobody listens to it except for Nigel and Wendy, wait, does Wendy listen to That Gets My Go? I don't know. I I would assume so, but I Uh, don't know. If nobody listened but Nigel and his super, super hot girlfriend with an accent, I would be fine because it's just I love to talk about things that I am passionate about and to listen to other people and to argue or maybe not argue, but listen and and try and see how other people feel and all Mm -hmm. that stuff. But uh, Tales of the Beetle Bard, probably my second favorite part of the whole movie. We had an animated sequence in Harry Potter 7, something that was unprecedented. We'd never gotten anything even remotely like that before. And... There's no way. I mean, the dude, I would have tossed that out in a second had I been the a- adapter of the book. You know what I mean? I would have had two lines of dialogue say what the three Deathly Hallows were. 
And these guys not only took that and made like a seven minute sequence out of it, but it was visually awesome and fun. And it's just like, wow, it's something that I couldn't have <laughs> predicted. And I love that when somebody surprises me and when somebody takes something, you know, direction I never would have thought to do. Seems to me that you'd have to leave that in though. Like you said, that would be the first thing you'd toss out, but it's like you complaining that the half-blood prince is a side plot that you can toss out kind of a thing. It's the title of the friggin' movie, the title of both movies for that matter, because it's part one and two. Um, I didn't say I would toss it out. I said I would <laughs> replace it, it really by two or three sentences. As but you could just the say, prince. these are the deathly hallows. Right. The first is the sword of Just have crazy old The second is the dildo of Hufflepuff. That is the cock ring of, okay, I'm very sorry. You know, I mean, that's what I would have done. But again, I didn't adapt the movies. And there's this scene straight out of the fudge in Lord of the Rings, about halfway through the movie. Instead of a dark lord, you will get a queen, beautiful and terrible as the foundation of the earth. My favorite part of that whole movie. I was just like, wow, dude. Wow, I was floored. And and see, this is why I wanted to talk to your kids at the very beginning of this conversation, because I had a conversation with my friend Jeff where I said, oh my gosh, it was so adult. It was so grown up that I was just like looking around and thinking, I, I wonder if there are any little kids here. And I felt I, I was so not condescended to at all. And I started to wonder if maybe the Harry Potter books and movies aren't for adults. And all that for kids, you mean? I was wondering if maybe they are for adults oh, okay. and, and not for kids. And, and that's why I wanted to ask the kids. You've got a seven-year-old. I wanted to say, okay, Harry Potter movies and books, are they for kids or are they for grown-ups? And see what she would say and ask each one in turn and then ask them why and, and if it ever got too scary. And if they would rather, instead of a dark lord, have a queen, beautiful and, and terrible as the foundation of the earth. And I know I'm getting that quote wrong, but you know what I'm trying. It's, you know, when Galadriel turns into that fudge and horrible monster oh dude i didn't just wet my pants i shat my pants yeah. there was a scene like that in harry potter and i don't know why i'm mincing words because surely we'll put a spoiler alert at the spoiler point. alert right warning the following episode contains movie spoilers yeah. thanks uh, announcer man for getting that <laughs> it's a little late dude uh but <laughs> Wow. You have no idea what it sounded about. like a drunk dude at a party or something there for a second. Which this is just Dr. Thunder you're drinking here. This isn't Irish Dr. Thunder. <sighs> it's not even good. But yeah. <laughs> you you don't seem to know what I'm talking about. I'm trying to uh you you're quoting Lord of the Rings here instead of Harry Potter, so I'm trying to figure out what it is you're referring to. Okay, so there's a moment when the Horcrux, the, the, oh. the embodiment of the Dark Lord's power, tries to intimidate Ron. And uh -huh. it forms into like a perfect version of Hermione that looks exactly like Dark Galadriel. Exactly. <laughs> and she says Glistening just these and awful things. Uh -huh. and, and, and she and Harry are fucking... <laughs> I mean, I, yeah, am I wrong? I, well, yeah, that's... You know, it's funny because uh, I think I confessed to this last week... Did you? Last episode that I work in news. And uh, yeah, that was something that we did a story about is, oh, will you take your kids to see Harry Potter? It's got a nude scene in it. Of course, nobody had seen this nude scene. They've just been told or heard about it somehow. And my aunt is shrieking, I told you! And witchcraft! Yeah. So then you finally go to see it and you're like, oh... That was the nude scene? Well, I guess you could kind of see her shoulder. Wow, thank Buddha I didn't know that that was coming. Because <laughs> it just, it so surprised me. And that's what I meant. It was just like, wow, this may very well be for grown-ups. Yeah, but when they start making out, and they're making out hardcore, man, they're not just... They're like... <laughs> but, okay, dude, I, I totally... I mean, okay, I, Hermione has been my favorite character... In all the books, uh -huh. although I do love Snape. But yeah. dude, from beginning to end, I was Ron watching that movie because Ron is the F up, definitely <laughs> in this case. And Ron is the one that is expendable and all that and can't accomplish what the others can. I mean, he's the chosen one and she's the friggin' smartest girl in the world. And, and yeah, in that moment, I totally, I, I mean, it's like it was, it was for me. 
from Ron's point of view of just, yeah, of course, it's feeding on his fears and insecurities and all that stuff. And I just, wow, it was so, so great and spoke to me so much that I just, like the next day was still thinking about that and just, wow, that was really cool that they, they, they went that far mm-hmm. because they didn't have to. Where they yeah. really could have pulled their punches. From what I understand, when they shot that, I mean, again, information from our whole news story, when they shot that sequence in the first place, they had like a whole bunch of like mist going all over the place to make it seem kind of ethereal, et cetera. And, and the director said, you know what? This isn't working because we can't see enough. And so they cleared out all the mist and shot it without it so you could see more they wanted it to be more sensual for this scene so um well yeah, did, did they you went there did you have a problem with that no i mean like again you, like you, i said you're you've got kids though right um because you're not gay <laughs> and see i feed you the line you don't jump on it <laughs> I thought we decided to stop the gay jokes way back when. So. Oh, well, I think it's fair game when you're referring to me as gay. Uh, not that there's anything wrong with that. No, I wouldn't think so. Okay, so you got schloads of little kids running all friggin' over, and they're <laughs> they're over. naked and filthy, and they got rickets. <laughs> they um, don't even wear diapers; they just <laughs> pee on the floor, and we just—it's just caked on. Now we just put a towel over it. Jeez. <laughs> oh, okay, maybe I'm exaggerating slightly, but where, are you uncomfortable with this? Would you take your? I mean, now which is more daunting to you that the Harry Potter movies are effing scary? Or that there might be this scene with that hot little girl with no clothes on. Well, yeah, I don't know. It is daunting. One thing about violence in general, which there is a lot of, especially in this movie. I mean, you open up with the scene where that like woman is floating nearly dead over the table. As that was rough, man. Sit her, and they keep showing close-ups of her all beaten and bruised and moaning and stuff like that. You know, that is violent stuff. But the thing about our society is violence has never been hidden. It's never been something that you wait until you're old enough to understand before you're exposed to. I mean, every little cartoon starts out with that, all the way back to the early days of cartoons when Bugs Bunny and the Roadrunner and all that were just pounding on their uh, adversaries, and Home Alone came out, and it was a big deal, and, you know, it was a pretty, you know, those poor burglars. Mutilated Burglars get Macaulay what they Tolkien. deserve because, you know, you're not supposed to burgle, but... Uh, Unless you're a priest. That's In okay. part two, they just took it to another level. And I remember, I want to say it was Ebert who was talking about how, you know, all these things that Macaulay Culkin did to these burglars. And he he numbered like the amount of things that they did that would probably have resulted in the death of these burglars. Were they real people, you know, instead of cartoon characters, basically. And, you know, this is a thing that's been done to children. Children have been taught to take violence to handle violence to even laugh at violence from the beginning but you know sex is something that is hidden it's saved until you get to an age where maybe you can understand these things and you're just told that babies are found in the cabbage patch or that the stork brings them or that santa knocked up your mom right i saw mommy in santa claus how come some punk band hasn't done that yet? Oh, you would, I'm sure they have. I saw Mommy blowing. <laughs> you would um, think that something like that would have happened. Maybe it has. Our, our, our society is diseased, and, and it's, it's, it's about ready to, to collapse upon itself. And then China is just going to take over, which I fear. But, you know, when I see Sarah Palin on TV <laughs> and stuff, I realize that hey, it's, no political. it's inevitable. Come on, man. It's just... It's, We're not going there. That's, that is something that I've never understood is, is the level of acceptable violence and then the level of acceptable sex. It's, it's, it's crazy because, different. dude, any functioning adult should experience sex. I, I, every child... That should be for them down the line, you know. It's like, but you're never going to experience yeah, sawing the top of somebody's head off and cooking their brain in front of them and feeding some of it to them. <laughs> I mean, that, I, I saw a commercial just today. It was at the beginning of a DVD for that furry vengeance abomination. Uh, it's a, another uh, movie with what's his name? Brendan Fraser. Brendan Fraser. Fraser. Who is, I, I think, physically incapable of appearing in good movies. <laughs> it's just, or, or maybe it's contractual. 
Yeah. Um, there's this scene where I guess he's doing battle with all the cute, let's see, little woodland creatures where one of them knocks a container of hot coffee into his face and it goes, and he goes, ah! dude, I was horrified <laughs> by that. That wasn't funny. That, I mean, it made a noise and stuff, you know, <laughs> dude. That's funny well, in hell is what I, I, I know what you're saying, but it, like I said, you go all the way back to Home Alone 2 again. You know, he, Macaulay Culkin was throwing like hammers and wrenches and things from like three stories up and they would pound on Joe Pesci's head as they came down. You know, these things would crush the guy's skull in where he somehow not a cartoon character and able to take all sorts of violence and then just stand back up. But yeah, that's it's just something that's always been the case. So I don't know if children understand it better or able to deal with it better or not. In that story that we did in the news, they interviewed a psychologist or whatever about what's the difference? There's there's sex, there's violence. What is worse for these children to see? And uh, the psychologist said, you know, sex is really um, not something that's going to stunt your child nearly as much as the violence will, especially if your child already has some kind of aggression issues or something like that. The more violent things he sees, the more he will act out and be aggressive and so forth. So Now, did you tell me, and this can be cut if it turns out your son is a serial killer, that when Anakin Skywalker caught on fire at the end of that movie that he laughed? Yeah, he did. He, d- I, I don't think he understood exactly what the deal was with it. You know, he was very young. Still. Wow, that part at the beginning where that teacher, uh, that unfortunately we'd never seen before. Right. God, what a waste. Says Severus, we're friends, dude. That is so awful. Yeah. I mean, much, much more awful than any. I mean, it's something sexual that I can imagine. And now, uh, granted, I'm a grown up. But I just the thought of that, that's what I would want to shield a child from. Right. And, and what's worse than rape? Betrayal. I'm sorry, according to the general's daughter. Do you remember we would always talk about what's worse than rape.com? And just th- this poor, poor person who's just being humiliated and tortured and then murdered and then fed to the friggin' CG snake. Not even a, a snake <laughs> even like a shot in a snake. close up so that it looks huge. Oh, geez. The, the, the indignity of that, of, of, of a human life and all that. And, and I understand that this is not admirable. Right. And that uh, this is a bad guy. Voldemort is a scumbag and, and, that's and all that. That's the reason why we let him and, do these things. But yeah, but it was, it was awful. But see, now I don't travel in the same circles and all that. And I don't, I don't know, you know, if parents are suggesting you not take your kids to that. But it, again, going back to Star Wars, there was a lot of talk before that one came out in 2005 that maybe this one is one you Yeah, it was the first PG-13 Star Wars as opposed to all the others being PG. And yeah, I remember you asked me what I thought because I saw it before you did. And yeah, it it had a bad beheading at the very beginning. And and it had... The the, the thing that was so rough was just like him screaming when he was on fire Mm -hmm. to me. Yeah, it was Uh, a a, a pretty intense scene. And I think that's had to be part of it as to why my son i don't think he knew how to respond to something like that and he was five years old at the time you know i don't think he was prepared he wasn't old enough and it probably was something that we should have skipped that was probably the time when i realized yeah maybe i shouldn't and i had to explain no this isn't something funny this is this is a really really bad sad terrible moment here and no i mean he's he's seen it since because we have the DVD, and he pulls those out and just puts them on whenever he wants, which isn't that often, especially the third one. I don't think he's watched it very much. He watches the first and second one much more. But it's a hard thing to, to figure out what you let your children do in these days. It seems like everybody just lets their children watch whatever. I mean, they're showing them the omen when they're three or whatever. Yeah, I, wait, wait. I don't know who could possibly do that. That's horrible, dude. <laughs> the worst babysitter in the world might pull that. That's but. true, yeah. Was that farting? <laughs> Ew. Um, there was a lot of blood in this one. It, when Ron got splinched. Yeah, that one. But then also Dobby, just the whole front of his tunic was bloody. And, and Hermione had some on her hands, or am I thinking of when Ron got splinched? Yeah, but, Dob- you know, they show the dagger and it's got blood on it and stuff. And to me, well, another non-condescending moment 
We're just like we're showing that death is ugly and that there are real stakes here. Mm-hmm. And that, you know, if it were a movie for little kids, wouldn't you pull your punches? Wouldn't you? I, I don't know because I, I see. I had my argument with my friend about who this was for, and he hadn't seen the movie yet. But I felt like it was for me. Yeah, I, I think I would agree with you. They didn't pull their. Maybe that's good when it comes down to it. You know, if you're gonna show kids violence. Don't make it something like where Macaulay Culkin throws a sledgehammer down from the roof three stories up, lands on the guy's head, and he's fine. He just falls down, and then he gets back up, and, oh, I need an aspirin or something, you know. It show the actual consequences of violence, and maybe kids will understand that this is not something that you want to also do. You don't want to act this out, because this is bad. And maybe that's the way things should be. I don't know. I'm not a psychologist, so I don't know what kids should see or shouldn't see or whatever. Maybe that's the best way to go about it, you know? Don't pull your punches so people will know, yeah, this is hard. And it's one thing to see it in a movie, but it's not something you should do. And so then you wouldn't have those stupid teenagers that go out and do the same dumb effing stunt that the friggin' jackass people do. Oh. Yeah. Or Beavis and Butthead, where they throw an effing bowling ball off of a freeway overpass and kill somebody because they're too stupid to realize the difference between a cartoon and reality. Maybe if these kids had read Harry Potter. Yeah, there you go. Maybe. They'd understand that violence has consequences and they're going to spend the rest of their damn life in jail for it. Although they probably didn't because they were minors and so they were, oh, they just stayed until age 18. And then they were homeless probably for the rest of their life. So I'm sure they had some consequences. But, you know, weird that I got all fired up about that all of a sudden. No, but. Well, I've been fired up six <laughs> or seven times tonight. But, yeah, uh, you know, maybe that's the way entertainment needs to be. You know, we, we've glossed over things too much and made our, our bad guys getting hurt or, or whoever getting hurt into Wile E. Coyote getting a rock dropped on top of them, which, you know, it's not the same. You get crushed by a rock, you're dead. And it's messy and bloody and disgusting and, you know, horrible. And it shouldn't be something that you can laugh at. (laughs) Sorry, have I? (laughs) You're making a face over there like I've pounded on you for too long. (laughs) No, it's it's fine. (laughs) I don't know. I just realized we've talked for a long time. Yeah, I was Um, thinking that too. But, you know, I don't care. I think we'll only get two episodes this month or may, maybe yeah. if we're lucky we'll get three this but may you're already be december right? by the time uh, this one comes out so yeah probably okay well i hope that the show is still around uh, <laughs> seven months from now or whatever and we'll we'll go see harry potter eight and we'll talk about it a part of me sort of wishes that they hadn't called it part one and part two i know that rowling had a bunch of alternate titles for her books that she bandied about and it would have been kind of interesting if you know, the seventh one had been called something else, and then the eighth one was in the Deathly Hallows and all that. But maybe that's confusing. Maybe you know, people go, "What the heck? This is a, uh, this isn't a book that I've read." Ah, we'll see. I, I I'd really like to talk about it, and just the same way that you can't really talk about how great the Harry Potter series of books is until it's done. Right. Then you can step back and look at it with some perspective. Same thing with the film series. I think it's been a little bit uneven, but on the most part, it's been really well done. Much better done than than other series that we've seen recently. But at the end of the day, we got to see how that eighth one ends up. And if it ends satisfyingly, and if you just sigh and go, wow, we were really lucky to have lived through this this 10 years of of filmmaking. Yeah. Well, I'm excited to see it. Hopefully it'll uh, live up to expectations, especially since we already know how it ends. You know, if it turns out as well as the books turned out, that would be good. Yeah. Oh, and since we aren't going to get to get my goat, I saw a commercial for Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows Part 1. And it included all sorts of scenes that weren't in the movie yeah. stuff. It included the part where Voldemort has Harry by the face and he gives this line that's at the end of the bloody book. Dude, I mean, it's just like, wow, this won't happen for months and months. And you've just shown it in the trailer. That doesn't seem too honest to me. It seems a little unfair. They were doing that. I mean, I think it may come from the first trailers that they did where they were basically doing trailers for both films. And they said, the event of a generation split across two movies. Splinched. Yeah, splinched. (laughs) Maybe it comes from that. And that's why they're doing that because they originally just were using footage from both movies for 
that trailer, and now they've just said, eh, what the hell, let's just go with it. It's, it's, but you get that kind of crap. We must have mentioned this, or we've at least had a conversation about this, where you see a trailer and they show funny stuff or whatever, and then you go to see the movie and none of that was in the movie. You're like, wait, what happened to that bit that was in the trailer? And yeah, it's just some kind of cutting room floor scene or line or whatever that they included in the trailer, but not in the movie itself. <laughs> that kind of irritates That's me sometimes. That's always bothered me because sometimes the way it's delivered in the trailer, the actual line is what you remember and it's better. And you're just like, oh, right. I like that. You know, I, I don't know. There's, there have been some. Yeah. And now a word from our sponsors. From the makers of Barbie, Princess and the Popper, Barbie Mariposa, Barbie Diaries, and Barbie the Human Centipede comes a great adventure. When something needs to be found, something vaguely religious and really hard to find, there's only one person you can call. Okay, not really a person, but more like a doll. You get me now? I'm Kenny Ram, a handsome stranger. Hello, handsome stranger. You look lovely today, Barbie. Did I mention that I'm handsome? I don't remember. Barbie, how about some champagne? Or non-alcoholic sparkling cider? And some light kissing. Sounds nice. I just hope you don't turn out to be evil. If adventure has a name, it must be Barbie and doll. As in... Barbie Doll, if that were actually her name. That belongs in a museum. But I'm going to get it first. That is my plan because of my evil. Evil. <laughs> Where did you get your little bodyguard? Skipper? She's my sister. Yes, but where did she come from? Didn't you hear? When a man loves a woman very much, he takes her to a secluded place, preferably a motel suite or a men's room. No, no, no. That's not what I was asking. Never mind. I'll just kidnap her and try to kill you. All right, but be warned. I'll stop you in less than 50 minutes. What makes you so sure? Because this is my video series, and none of these are more than 82 minutes long. Barbie in her greatest adventure yet. Though with our target audience, that's not really saying much. My sister Barbie is the world's greatest archaeologist, a hero and finder of lost antiquities. Here, drink this. My sister Barbie must be destroyed. Mm, that was fast. Skipper, what have they done to you? Kenny Ma protects us. We are his children. No! Can Barbie doll triumph over the forces of evil in her classic and impossible for a child to actually emulate way? Kenny Ram, prepare to meet Kali. In the disorganized clearance aisle of an inner city Kmart. No! That's right. Barbie doll in the Temple of Doom. And next year, just in time for Valentine's Day. I have such wonders to show you, Ken. <laughs> Barbie Hellraiser. Also available in 2D. Ben, what was the first podcast you ever listened to? It was probably soccer related, right? No, actually, I think the first podcast I ever listened to was Escape Pod. Really? Yeah. And of all the Escape Pods, what was your favorite episode? That's not hard to come up with, owing to the fact that you and I both, we we're film geeks, we went to film school. The show that jumped out at me more than any other, and I swear, I, I remember even what I was doing when I listened to the show it is that memorable. I was mowing my lawn as I listened to this story, and my wife could tell that I was enjoying it because she'd see me out there mowing the lawn, smiling and chuckling to myself as the episode ran. But Impossible Dreams by Tim Pratt has got to be my favorite story that I've ever listened to on any podcast. Cool. I guess you know where this is going. I do. 
We got an email from uh, Dave Thompson over at Podcastle recently, and they asked he asked uh, if I would do him a favor and read a story for Podcastle for the podcast, the holiday episode of the podcast. And I said yes, of course, because, you know, why not? Right. I love to read the stories and to help somebody else out. And uh, turns out the story that they, they handed me was The Christmas Mummy by Heather Shaw and Tim Pratt. Yeah. Uh, it's a heartwarming <laughs> Christmas tale, holiday story. And I, oh boy, I got to just go nuts with the voices and the whole bit. I got to be kids. I got to be a, like a, a, a super villain. It was really, really fun. I mean, hopefully they thought that I did a good job and they'll ask us to do it again. Be nice if uh, Escape Pod would uh, let us taint their lovely <laughs> podcast as well. But uh, you can check that out. It's up already over at uh, podcastle.org. Yeah, that's right. The Christmas Mummy by Heather Shaw and Tim Pratt. Tim Pratt is all over the uh, podcasts these days. The Podosphere. Yeah, you can find him on Podcastle. You can find him on Escape Pod. You can find him on Pseudopod. You can find him on Drabblecast. He's got stories everywhere. And I don't know that there's ever been one of his that I've listened to and not enjoyed. And this one is definitely one of those stories. It's And you said Heather Shaw is his wife. I believe so, yes. I could be completely mistaken because it's oh. not like I'm smart. But yes, I think that Heather Shaw is his wife. And so they wrote that together as a special heartwarming <laughs> Christmas Why do you tale. mock me that heartwarming? <laughs> Is it just I'm not the kind of guy to use the word heartwarming? No, I think it's just the nature of the tale. It's not like it's it's a wonderful life or something. <laughs> We're talking a different kind of a tale altogether here. But it's still a very fun tale. <clears throat> All right, so go over and check that out. You know, Big, you once called me a warped, twisted old man. Well, you're a warped, twisted young man. Okay. Merry Christmas and Happy New Year in jail. <laughs> Should I have done my old man Potter voice for that? You don't need to. We'll be okay. <laughs> and now a word about... What the crap? Hi. Happy. Wait, what are we doing again? We're promoing that thing? No. We were going to wish Happy Christmas to our listener. <laughs> <laughs> happy Christmas, baby. We wish you, like you a happy song? Christmas. Of course I do. You do? You like Bruce Springsteen, though, don't you? I do. Uh. He's the boss. <laughs> Who's the boss? I'm sure it was Tony Angela, <laughs> Mona, Samantha. Didn't we do a story where we did that voice, that uh, Tony Danza and Who's the Boss voice? It's possible. Pig. <laughs> We've done a lot of stories with a lot of voices. Apparently not enough. Liz goes off and sells her story to friggin' pseudopod. Oh, she loved us, man. <clears throat> sell my story to Pseudopod before I sold it to us? I dare you. <laughs> <laughs> then again, I would have to write a story to sell it to anybody. You know, that, that reminds me. Liz has... Um, now, do we do we call her the unpronounceable name, or do we call her Liz Ann Hurd? Or? I think you just call her Liz Ann Hurd, because you can't pronounce her name. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Liz Ann Hurd issued this challenge for the year 2011. Uh, 2021, oddly enough. No, uh, for the year of three. Okay. For uh, I've heard about for that. For writers or, or people that, like you that would like to someday write. To vow to make a pact, to promise, if you will, to write one story every two weeks for the, mo for the month of 2011. <laughs> <laughs> I will, it's something called like the 25 stories in 52 weeks. Hold on. I just joined this group and it was hella... And I don't say that word lightly. It was hella hard to find the dang group. Okay, the group is called 52 Weeks 25 Stories Challenge. Barbie 52 Weeks 25 Stories Challenge. Turns out Barbie is actually in charge of the group, too. How about that? Yeah, it's just, I guess, some kind of Facebook group for writers of, you know, just something where they'll encourage one another and people can post how they're doing on this goal of writing a story every other week. And, you know, every other week is not too much to ask, really. I, I mean, it depends on the length of your story. Or, right. Or your if genitals. you're writing novellas right. every time, then you're probably not going to make it. But do you think that you would be able to pull that off? 
Uh, they would lie and say yes so that if, you can play the promo. If I actually put the effort in, then yes. It's not too much to ask. And putting the effort in would be, I think, a very worthwhile thing because you have to do it like every day to keep up. You know what I mean? You couldn't just leave it till the last minute and then write. I guess you could if you're one of those types of people that can just sit down and write for 10 hours in a row or something. But I don't think that I'm one of those kinds of... I can't edit on the podcast for that long, that's for sure. I noticed that today as what I What happens after like the third hour? Or I, I just can't pay enough attention to it. I, I, I start like clicking off on the internet and looking at the email and uh, turning on the TV or whatever. I find that if I sit long enough, I start clicking off too. He shoots and wham, right off the rim. So Liz created this this challenge, this group, and... I told her that we would mention it on the show, see if we could get a bunch of people to join. Oh, her group. so it's your fault. I would say that it's Liz's <laughs> fault, but it's oh, part, oh, okay. partly mine, yeah. I will share some of the blame. <laughs> but yeah, she's a really good writer, and she sold the story to Pseudopod, which pays. You know what? I, I'm just going to come out and say F Pseudopod. Ready? <laughs> One, two. You know, wait, wait, maybe I should. Your jealousy is unbecoming. Is it you right? wish that you were Alistair Stewart, admit it. In bed. So, anyhow. <laughs> What? Okay, well, let's let Liz speak, because she created a promo. I don't think it was a just promo? for us, but... Oh, you know what? F it. It was just for us. And yeah, no way it hell wasn't Alistair for Pseudopod, dang it. Go, go ahead and roll that, if you would. I wish I could find some time to write. Writing is such a lonely business. I just need some Writing is such no a lonely business. No one wants to read my stories. My I hate doing this alone. Writing is such a lonely business. Looking for a community of writers who just want to support each other in a lofty goal? Have a trunk load of ideas, but no set plan on how to turn them into the great short stories you know they're meant to be? Join the 52 Weeks 25 Stories Challenge, a small community of writers with a simple goal. Each person commits to writing one short story every two weeks. In a year, that's 25 stories with room to spare for NaNoWriMo. Find us on Facebook at 52 Weeks 25 Stories Challenge. Commit to the challenge or just cheer us on. Make 2011 your year to succeed in getting those words on the page. Okay, during that promo, uh -huh. didn't that ring a few familiar bells? Yeah, I think that was actually a recording of the inside of my head. That early part. I mean, not later when Liz just kept talking about this group, because that usually doesn't play on the inside of my head, it turns out. Mostly the first line. I'll say the first line. She must have clipped it out of an old show. That wasn't really me, though, was it? That was somebody else. Uh, there are some that call him Tim. Oh. <laughs> the plan is just to encourage one another to set goals and see if you can fulfill the goal. What do you call actually achieving a goal? Achieve the goals. Oh. And I've never heard it put that way. That's to be in a positive environment where people aren't. And well, Liz is a good person. I know a couple other people that are in the group. Um, good people, them all. Yeah, both of them. <laughs> the group needs to get bigger, by the way. I joined it and Rish has joined it. You know what else needs to get bigger? Oh, I'm sorry. We're Finish not, your sentence. We're moving on. So, yeah, people join this group because it can be more supportive if more people join. You and I have podcasting capability. Renee and Liz both have podcasting capability. We may end up doing something about this, you know, like a monthly update telling people how it's going, or we may end up podcasting a couple of these stories or whatever, just as long as you don't have to edit them, right? <laughs> Doesn't that seem like it would be kind of interesting to have like some kind of podcast that's set aside just for this kind of thing, and we share stories or we share how we're doing on the stories and share encouragement and share bodily fluid help? That does sound like fun, yes. Especially the bodily fluid. <laughs> Please, I, let's share. She should have sent us a script for the promo. It's one of those things that people <laughs> never learn. You would just ad Kevin David anyways. Anderson, the last time he ever spoke to us, he was like, hey, how about if you create a promo for my uh, audio market list? I'm like, okay. Never hear back from the guy. He hung his head in shame so bad he got a concussion. <laughs> and tell people again how to... So yeah, it's a Facebook group. Everyone is a member of Facebook already. We all know that. The group is called the 52 Weeks 25 Stories Challenge. If you search that in the search at the top, it will come up. 
Mm-hmm. And then, yeah, you can join. I... Are we going to regret this thing? Like, Kind of like the dunestief.org thing that we ended up regretting. <laughs> it's like, wow, we paid for dunestief.org and we've never used it. <laughs> maybe. I don't know. It, it, it goes hand in hand with a New Year's resolution, right? Yeah. I, and I'm... maybe this is a way to help people prolong those New Year's resolutions. Oh, oh. And, yeah, and, and I, I, I need that all the time. You know, I'm sure it will. I, resolutions I, peters out for me. And then, <laughs> why would you stop? <laughs> I, okay. Is it me? I, 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 I. No, I probably will uh, regret it. Event. It's like every time I get on my stupid blog, I'm like, I'm going to write NaNoWriMo. And then I put one minute. N- no, sorry. One minute is too many. I put uh, half a minute of effort into that entire thing. And then someday people are going to say, what the hell happened with that? Or what happened to all these other countless? I go through your blog and there's just posts about how you're going to do something that you never do. But if you had people sending you emails saying, hey, listen, Jagoff, you said you were going to do this. Don't you feel you'd feel a little bit more accountable? You'd be like, you know, you're right. I'm sorry. I was going to go to sleep. I'm going to stay up 15 more minutes. Okay, I did it. F you. (laughs) <laughs> you know what I mean? It does help the the few times that I have achieved things. It does have a tendency to be uh, when you're on my back saying, dude, you suck. I hate you. And I've gained you a lot of said, weight too, so being on your back is not what it used to be. You said you were going to do a Christmas episode with me and you haven't done Jack, so I hate you. Hey, we still have minutes. Oh, uh, never mind. Those few times I have actually achieved something tend to come from that. So... Hopefully this will be a good thing, and I won't regret that I keep getting pinged from everybody on Facebook saying, Hey, Jagoff, you said you were going to do this, and you haven't, so do it. See, that's something that I'd really like to overcome and get into the habit of actually just doing it. Well, there was some dude who said that you only have to do something for like 21 days straight or 15 days straight or twice, and it becomes a habit, and your synapses start saying, Hey, I must do this every day, and... I won't be able to perform in bed if I don't do it, you know, kind yeah. of thing. It's like some psychosomatic reaction. Honey, I don't understand what's wrong. It's, it, this hasn't <laughs> happened to me before. Uh, at least that's what the guy said in a message board or whatever where he mentioned this. And, and I don't know if there's truth to that, but if there is, wouldn't that be cool? If All you have to do is just do it, right? Every day on your lunch hour for a week. And the next week you're like, geez, I'm hungry, but I've really got to write. Yeah, I think that would be uh, worth it. What Was it two days, you say? I don't know. All I know is that uh, you had the chance <laughs> to be, a, to real be a real writer. And I blew it. No, you have a gift, man. And if you don't uh, yeah, exercise that gift, under the, tree right now, but. It, uh, the moths get it. I don't know how that story goes about the gift. You'll find out that she's cut off all her hair oh, and no. sold it to get that you a gift. And I then bought. you've got a wife with really, really short hair. And we don't need that. Yeah, no one needs that. Hey, that ain't funny, man. How about that? It's a marginally offensive guest star. And what was the other one? The hell? I think it's the same guy. But he sounds so different sometimes. It's just when he gets riled up. Well, let's invite him to also join the Facebook group. Okay. Fine. Would you like to join this 52 weeks, 25 stories challenge? Hell no, Rich Alfield. Oh. Okay, well, <laughs> don't be like marginally offensive guest star and... <laughs> Join the group. That's right. And more importantly, flex those creative muscles. Write something. The world can do with 25 more stories. Yeah. Because all we're getting right now is remakes and sequels (laughs) and reimaginings of old TV shows. So we need more new stories. Speaking of that, I'm really excited about that new uh, Yogi Bear movie. Oh, you know, by the time this airs, that will have come and gone (laughs) the way of the dodo. You know what bothers me most in that trailer is it should just be all the booger jokes or the the fact that they hired Justin Timberlake and Dan (laughs) Aykroyd to just do impressions of those two characters and not sound like themselves, which A, it was a huge waste of money. And two, do people really go see animated films because a celebrity did the voice anymore? But the thing that bothers me the most is when the turtle shoots out his long lizard tongue. (laughs) Turtles don't have that kind of tongue, dude. The thing that bothers me the most is when the turtle shoots out its long lizard tongue and then it says, You'll see more laughs in 3D. Ah, right. It's a 3D gimmick. You know, 
a turtle that flies out at you. I'm really awesome. surprised that somebody hasn't leapt on the anti 3D hysteria to put in like a comedy trailer or whatever. You know, see it in 2D. And, you know, it's like an extraordinarily flat text that comes up. There's some movie with the guy with the effed up nose or. Uh, Paul Rudd or something like that. And it's uh -huh. like shown exclusively in 2D. Take that, DreamWorks. <laughs> what? You think there's ever been a trailer where they say, take that, DreamWorks, at the end? <laughs> there should be. Anyways, I got to pee, so we need to end this. Okay. Uh, well, thank you for listening. <laughs> do I need to apologize for something I've said? Probably, but. Will it do any good if I apologize? Not never really does okay i'll phrase it this way i apologize if you're a fan of the show and something i said hurt your feelings yeah i don't think that there was much that likely went that way so okay you're okay you just expect to say offensive things now <laughs> well it happens every week yeah I don't pretty know. soon we're gonna kick you off the show Sick and tired of your crap. All right, all right, that's funny. You would be nowhere without me. <laughs> <laughs> We've been talking for a long darn time. Way too long. I'm sure you've all gone to bed, but if you haven't, good night. Happy Christmas. Happy Christmas, Harry. Happy Christmas, Ron. So long, and thanks for all the fish. The Dune Steve is released under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. So you can give it to anyone, but you cannot change it or make money off it. Full on double rainbow. All the way. Okay, bye folks. See ya. Don't you, don't you, don't you?